All right, let's get started with the Nokar Mantra. Om Namo Arihantanam Om Namo Sitanam Om Namo Ayadiyanam Om Namo Ujjayanam Namo Lowe Savasahunam Eso Panchanamo Karo Sarva Pava Panasano Mangalalancha Savasim Paramam Have Mangalam Paramam Have Mangalam Thanks, everybody, for joining this week. This is one of our very last classes, I think, this one, and we have one more after this one. Uh, so let's talk about money today. Uh, we ended our discussion last week about money, so I'd like to continue that discussion. Specifically, a bunch of people had questions about saving for kids for college. So I did some research, and I'd like to present to you what I found, and then let's talk about that, and let's also talk about how we feel about money in general. And uh, it's fine if we don't talk about Jainism. This class is about you, and sometimes we talk about Jainism, and sometimes we don't. So the main way that people save for college for their kids are a 529 account, and Texas offers three different kinds of accounts. The first is called the Direct, the second is called the Advisor Sold Plan, and the third is called the Texas Guaranteed Tuition Plan. And so let's talk about each one of them, direct, advisor sold, and uh, guaranteed tuition. So the direct plan is called Texas College Savings Plan, and that is at texascollegesavings.com. And I can show you the website here. All right, so you should be seeing the Texas College Savings website. This is the direct plan, and what it means by direct is you control the investments. That is, you decide which, how, where your money goes and how much of your money goes where, whether that's stock funds, bond funds, things like that. Um, and that's why it's called direct. Of course, the main benefits of 529 are that your money grows tax-free. And then when you take it out, if it's for a qualified expense, you don't pay taxes on it. And so that brings up the question, what is a qualified expense? So let's talk about what qualified expenses are. Let's stop showing that. Okay, so what are qualified expenses? Tuition is a qualified expense, both full and part-time. Room and board is a qualified expense, so that means dorm rooms. And um, occasionally that means um, apartments and food. Technology items are a qualified expense. So computers, printers, laptops, and even internet service sometimes. Those are qualified expenses. Books and supplies. Boy, books are a racket in college. Um, that's one way to save money in college is to get used books off of Amazon. If you go to, for example, your kids will get a list, right? They'll say the teachers will have them buy these certain books. And usually they wrote them. And usually they're updated every year. And so they say buy these versions. And the reason they're updated every year is so you force your kid to buy a new version of the book at the bookstore. And these books are like $400, $500. It's a real racket. So you can save a lot of money uh, by getting used books or going uh, an alternative route, seeing if your professor can you know, um, give you an online copy of the book or something like that, but books are qualified expenses. So recently, student loan repayment is now a qualified expense. So if you end up not using all of the money in your 529, you can, if you have to take out loans, you can use the 529 if there's some left over, then you can use that to pay off those loans. So what is, what do people think are qualified expenses but are not qualified expenses. So transportation and travel. So it's not a qualified expense. Getting to school and coming back to school and uh, you know on a plane or commuting in your car or buying gas, we might think of those as business expenses for a company trip, but that's not a qualified expense for a 529. So general electronics and cell phones somehow are not qualified expenses. Uh, I guess the government thinks that everybody has a cell phone and it's kind of not school specific. So we're not going to include it in that bucket of qualified expenses. 
Sport and fitness club memberships, a lot of companies pay for that. Those are not qualified expenses for 529. So if you pay for a gym or even if you pay for the school gym, not a qualified expense. And insurance, health insurance obviously is tied up with our work. Health insurance is not a qualified expense. So you can't pay for doctor's visits, emergency room visits, urgent care visits, anything like that with your five, for your student, for your child, for your, with your 529 money. So now let's talk about, so that we talked about, and this is going to be the same for the first two, for direct and advisor sold. So let's talk about advisor sold. In Texas, the fi- the advisor sold 529 plan is Lone Star 529. And let's go to that website. All right, so you should be seeing the Lone Star 529 website. It's lonestar529.com. And then the difference between this and a uh, direct plan is the advisor controls the investment in the Lone Star 529 plan. That is, it is kind of a traditional model where somebody manages your money for you and decides your investments the best, the best way to do that. You don't actually pick the ones um, like you want your money to go to because somebody helps you with that. And so everything we talked about via five. 29 qualified expenses and not qualified expenses that applies here too. Um, so let's see. So let's stop there. So questions or comments on direct 529 plans and advisor sold 520, 529 plans. And then we can talk about the third, third category later. I have a question. Can this be used? Can this uh fun be used for like is it only children or like for example if i'm working on my mba or Sparka is working on something else can this money be used towards the education of ourselves so what happens is when you set up the account it's in the name of somebody so whenever you spend that money it's for that person so certainly you can use it for yourself but you can't use it for yourself from your children's account you have to set up your own account to do that. So that's how that works. All right, so those first two were similar. So let's talk about this third one, which is not similar. Texas offers a tuition guarantee. This is called the Texas Tuition Promise Fund. And it's at Texan, Texas Tuition Promise Fund.com. So let's take a look at that. All right, here we are at TexasTuitionPromiseFund.com. And if you scroll down, this is kind of where all the real meat of the information here is at the bottom, these quick links at the bottom. This is quite a bit different than the other two. I think most of us have a good idea of what's involved of, we put our money in and then it grows over time. And when we take it out, we have to make sure we spend it on the right thing. And we write, you know, we keep our receipts of all our expenses. I think most of us are familiar with that. This is totally different. Um, this is uh, something that we will have to look into. And there's a bunch of kind of facts here that we can go through. Welcome everybody who just joined. We are talking about how to save for our kids' college and we're talking about money in general. Right now we're talking about the Texas Tuition Promise Fund where you buy college credits at one price and then you use those college credits uh, when your child is ready to go to college and afterwards, um, if you don't use all of the credits, you can get uh, some kind of a refund. So how does it work? Let's see. So, so Timmy, this one is the one I think briefly I mentioned last time. Yeah. Um, and if, if you keep presenting it, that would be good, actually. Okay, uh, let me keep doing that. Yeah, yeah just going to give some synopsis on a very high level. Obviously, uh, my kids have not 
being into colleges, so I do not know how it unfolds at the hundred percent. But kind of the basic basic idea behind this one is you buy college credit using you using today's price. In other words, um, so there are multiple plans, and if you scroll into the plan on the top, uh, you will see multiple plan plan uh, pay as you go. Um, there are the a lot of different plans available on this one. Um, I generally prefer pay as you go because the price for the yearly credit. So let me just take a step back. So on an average, this is not the credit we credit credit hours we collect when we are in our bachelor's or master's degree. Yeah, this is the one I was going to ask you. So what it is is you buy the each kid when they go to the undergrad studies they will be going through four years of college and typically what you need is about 100 credit hours per year that means you need 400 credit units so this you you saw the type one type two type three these are the different types of college unit based on the rating of the college so if you're in the Houston and you have used uh, different types of college so let's say university of houston is categorized as a type one college that means if you want to go to type one college you should have used you should have paid 151 dollars now um to towards that goal so you can always change your colleges you do not know which college you're going to go at the end the kids will go at the end but if you start with type one or type two or type three it will be recalculated by the time you end and by the time kids going to go there so you start with that you 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 pick your goal and say okay i want to invest in let's say type two or type one or type three and say i have next five years i'm going to spend x amount and you just pay as you go now every year from october 1st till end of september i'm sorry i think end of august till first of september um <laughs> the price remains unchanged. So coming September 1st, I think the price will be changed from whatever unit price we saw. So you have a pay as you go option that you can start from from August 1st and that, that enrollment window is open only for, I think two or three months. In August, September, I think October it closes. So you have to enroll your kid in there um, and you choose, you wanna go with type one, type two or type three and you start paying it as you go. And basically for the throughout the year, it's the same price and number of units you collect is go towards your kid's account. Um, next September, uh, the price will change. Historically, it jumps between three to 5% or maybe 7% sometimes. Um, so that's how you basically accumulate your kid's credit. Now it has a maturity time of three years. So typically if the kid is gonna graduate after 12, they would prefer if you want to use all that funds on the first year of the college, then you want to invest it all the way up to the ninth grade. You can invest even in 10, 11, 12th grade, but it will remain unmatured for another three years before you can take that out. Um, so that's a, that's a piece on that one that you're buying college credit using today's price. Um, so, uh, and same thing what you mentioned about qualified and unqualified those expenses are still valid on this one but the calculation works slightly different when you are in a private schools versus pro pro private college versus uh, uh just state colleges so if i if my kid is going to the rice the calculations works quite differently than the if i if she's going to you know ufh or ut dallas or whatever um, and when I say calculation works differently, it's basically they have the state college are very just uh, state forward, uh, qualified, unqualified expenses. You can use, you want to maximize your um, first years and second year. They have very specific guidelines on every year how you're going to be able to consume those credits when they are in that college. But for private, it's a, it's kind of a, it's not a number of credit, it's actually the value. So let's say you ended up doing uh, 30,000, 40,000, whatever the amount you ended up doing in that, it goes straight towards your rice and you can use almost the entire, entire investment into first year if you choose to. Um, while in the state college, you have to actually divide it up based on the qualified expenses and all of that. So 
there are some guidelines on a private school, which is slightly different than a state school, but the, the concept is you buy the credit based on today's price. So in a private school, is the credit uh, book now? Is, is, is today's tuition? That yeah, the future? Price, okay. yeah, the price you saw is, is the price. So basically, let's say you did 100 credit, which is uh, and you did type one. So that is about 15 grand you spend. So that's your value of your portfolio. So when you are going in a private school, that 15K, let's say you did it for four years and you put 60K inside. And so in, in let's say Rice, you start going to college first, your college fee is 45K, whatever it is after scholarship and all. You could put 45k right from here, and it will it, it will not <clears throat> look at as your 300 400 credit units. It will look at your portfolio as a value. But that 45 that 45 thousand is today's number or five years from now number? No, no. When the key, so 45 you bought, let's say 400 units. That is 60k portfolio yeah. value is 60k. Today's rice price. So your kid is going to go to college the day the year kid is going to go to the college that's the price you are going to be paying okay. so, so rice changes his price from 60 to 90k then you still have your 60k it's not going to grow with time on that while the state colleges you have it actually credit units so right. it works with the units and right. that's right. No. So the, 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 the real i'm oh, sorry the real value would be if you go to a state college it's, just, it's credit for credit versus dollar for dollar because yeah. if it was dollar for dollar, you can do it outside of that plan. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and if you go out of state, you can go out of state. Any colleges you go, they will do the comparison and conversion between type one, type two, type three, and say, okay, if you go to Auburn, then it is equivalent to X amount uh, of credits, and that's how you can fund those colleges as well. So it's not limited to just Texas colleges. Yeah. But then you pay out of state fees. Right. I'm so glad that you're enrolled that we have you in, as an expert in this subject because it is quite complex compared to the other two. Uh, I am enrolled in the first type. Thank you for everybody who just joined. We are talking about the three types of 529s, direct, advisor sold, and tuition guarantee. Um, I am enrolled in the direct one. And so I can answer any questions anybody has on that. Do we have anybody here that's enrolled in the advisor sold plan? That is Lone Star 529. Then we'll have all three bases covered. Okay. So if anybody has questions about the direct one, I'm happy to answer those. It's it's much more simple than what we were just discussing. It's, um, it's quite, the complexity is quite low in that. Um, so I don't know, I couldn't tell you if it's a better value or not, um, but I can tell you that it's it's much simpler. Any questions about any of the three topics we talked about? I, I, have, a, I have a question. Oh, uh, I, just to get, get the overall uh, thing in mind, so the way I was calculating before when I mentioned 400, credit hours, I was just multiplying that by 1,000, which is what I pay, and maybe that's not my right way to do it, but then I thought, okay, so that's the $400,000 uh, that we are trying to collect. Uh, that, is, is that the right calculation? Or? No, 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 those credit units are what you saw the price when Timmy flashed the screen. So 400 credit units, instead of credit hours, we just need to say credit units. So it's a 151 was the type one, I think 120 or something for type two and 28 or something for type three. So it's a credit unit. 400 credit units is what you need to consider. Okay, so let's say 400 credit units. So 150 times 400 is what I should collect for each child? Yeah. Okay, and that's really a four year load. So I mean, and for type one college, it's 60 grand? Yeah, that's correct. Well, for some reason, I had a bigger number in mind talking to some of the other, maybe I'm thinking of uh, or somebody, but the, the numbers that I've heard from the parents are quite large. I was, you know, thinking of a, you know, $250,000 range. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, 
Yeah, you you still it has a qualified and qualified expenses, so it is not covering everything what they do, like you know, Timmy was explaining, and also you will have additional costs. There are a lot more cost ties to it depending on where the kid goes, right? Even if out of town or out of state has is a lot more expenses too. So uh, yeah, I mean the basic tuition and your books, your qualified expenses are covered. But if you go into private school, even within this within the state, that that money is quite differently used. And you can go more than four hundred credit units. Don't get me wrong. I mean, if you want to go in a private, you decided to go in private school, school. and then you may want to go and hire. You know, you you invest in additional credit. Hey, uh, Tim, I, I have a quick question for you. Uh, sorry, Umesh. Uh, I have a quick question for you on the first one. So it sounds like uh, that one is uh, just like a 401k plan where you pick your choices, uh, your investment choices. And obviously, the tax advantage is, is the big, uh, big deal there. So um, how have you found it so far in terms of the choices that you've got and I assume you're managing it yourself. Has it, uh, you know, has it been uh, uh, rewarding enough in choices? Uh, yeah, it, I would like more choices. There is about, there are about uh, 10 to 15 choices you can make and you can allocate your percentages among those. There are I appreciate that there are differences. The differences are stocks and bonds, right? And there's also a target fund. So if your kid is scheduled to go to college, you know, 16 years from now, it's just you can choose to do 100% in this and it will allocate your mix differently as time goes on. Those are called target date funds. Um, I would like a little more choice, but I think that's part of the draw of it is that the choices are simple because it's direct. Uh, but I would like a little more, but it's about 10 to 15. So <clears throat> you can have all, one of the choices is all, all bond, a bond fund, in which is just treasuries. Another choice is a, a growth stock option. Another choice is like a dividend stock option. Um, so the, those are the types of choices you have. I'd like a little bit more, but I understand that it's the draws to make it simple for people. Yes, Umesh. Yes, my question. If I uh, choose to type 1 and then take admission as type 2, so that always will get adjusted, right? The amount. And if suppose I invested in a type 2 and I take the admission for the type 1 college, then how it will be get adjusted? Yeah, so that calculation will be very straightforward. So basically, you have a number of units available. So let's say type 1 and type 2 has a 30 percent variance so basically if you put 100 credit units in type 2 it could be seven equivalent to 70 credit units for type 1 for instance so here we go here are the type of units we're talking about <clears throat> Based on 100 units equals 30 semester hours equals one academic year at most expensive Texas public college or university. Type 2 is the same weighted average cost of a Texas public college university excluding me medical and dental institutions. Type 3 is the weighted average cost of two-year Texas public colleges and universities Right. So here are the different types. Hey, so Martin, a quick question. Uh, I, what is the difference between type 1 type 2? I'm sorry. I, uh, yes. Type 1 type 2 type 3. Yeah, if you look at the University of Houston versus, um, let's say University of Houston has a rating has been now updated to tier 1. Uh -huh. So considering like a tier 1, tier 2, in my mind, that I mean, that's what I was I was comparing when I saw type one, but it's generally it's a, the comparison of your tier one versus tier two type of universities. I see. I see. Okay. Thanks. 
So that now that we're talking about kids and money, how many of us give our kids an allowance? Okay, three. And um, I know Nick has some good ideas about kids and allowance. Nick, can you tell us how you give your kids an allowance? You use a good program, right? Are you still using that program? Yeah, I use uh, I use something called Greenlight. It's uh six, sixty bucks a month, uh, sixty bucks a year for the whole family, and each child gets their own credit card. It's actually a debit card. So um, Rhea has her own, and Dia has her own, and their the app allows you to give them money by chores that they complete. So Rhea has to do the dishes Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Dia has to do it every other day. They have garbage duties, whatever. And so if they don't do it, we just dock that task and they don't get paid for it on Sunday. So like this morning, I got a thing saying, please, please advise if you want to clear their settlement, right? So I just say yes or no. And if, if no, then that's what it is, you know? Um, so, and the good thing is like, you know, when they go shopping and stuff or like the other day, Dia was like, Hey, you know what? Uh, I'm going to pay for dinner. If we go to this restaurant, I'm going to pay for dinner. So I'm like, all right, we're going to go to that restaurant. Then, right? You know? So we go to that restaurant and you know, the guy brings me the check and I was like, no, she's going to pay. And she takes out her a little credit card and then she learns how to do the tip and all the other stuff. Right. You know, so it's a, a learning experience. It's a mathematical tragedy in some sense, but yeah, you know, it kind of works out. Um, so I don't know, it's kind of worked out. It's pretty cool how like fluid it is. It also teaches them how to donate so they can actually save money to donate somewhere. Um, it teaches them interest. So I'm the, I'm the bank, right? So just for math's sake, they get 12% a year from me if they save the money in a savings account. And so they understand what it means to move to savings versus not. Um, let's see what other, uh, oh, and then they can do specific, uh, things. So let's say, I don't know, Dia wanted a specific game for her PlayStation or whatever, and that was $35. So she could make a, a you know, a little a savings account for $35 that, Hey, this is, and when it, when she hits it, she can go buy that kind of thing. You know, uh, it has a lot of other functions that I don't use. It has like rounding up and all this other stuff as well. But I think from a basic standpoint, the fact that you can see it on an app and they can manage their small amount of money, I would say, you know, um, I think is much easier than trying to show them their checking account and, you know, uh, ledger or some other kind of, you know, thing that we're used to. So I think it works pretty good. 60 bucks a year. It's not that bad. You can cancel anytime. I think it's 30 days free if you want to try it. Is it tied to any bank accounts or? So as the bank, you can, you, you attach it to a uh, Zelle or Venmo or your bank account. And then okay. you tell it to, so like mine is like, uh, you know, they draw like $200 at one shot. So that moves to my green light account. And then from my green light account, I can push it to them or I can oh. it back. More importantly, if I, let's say I, I went somewhere and they didn't bring their credit card, I paid for it, they owe me back. So it's like a wash account too. So it's, you know, uh, it's probably an easy way to try it out and make them understand something uh, to, to at least appreciate the, that part of it. Um, Rhea has been a little bit, my older daughter Rhea, she's been a little bit more active on it because she actually reconciles her account. Dia is like, I'm out of money. Now what do I do? Right. You know? And so it's a little bit different. Uh, uh, so, uh, but yeah, that's, that's how it is, you know? And, you know, they understand the difference between a debit card and a credit card, right? You know, um, debit, you got to have money to spend and, you know, credit, you can spend what you don't have. Right. You know? And so, um, you know, Dia's first question was like, Hey, when do I get a credit card? You know? <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. It's, it, it's, it, it, I think it's helped them out. I don't know if it's going to be like that forever, but we, we, maybe after a year or so, I, I think they get used to it and then we'll move it to something else. That's great. Leveraging technology to help out with uh, giving your child ownership over money. 
Uh, does anybody anybody that raise their hands that give their kids an allowance do it the old fashioned way that you just give them the cash every week or every two weeks? Yeah, I, I have that. They have their account in the bank, but that's about it. They have no debit card or anything to spend. Right. <laughs> so it get transferred. They don't see it. Uh, that's the that's the thing. I think this what Nick mentioned was I think a pretty smart way to teach them. I, right now they're just getting the expand uh, the the. Uh, allowances but that's pretty much it uh, i like it and but, do you recommend that for me i didn't grow up with an allowance my parents didn't give me an allowance um but do you recommend is has that helped I, either way whether you leverage a technology or not uh is that something you recommend to us for the people that do it oh, i would highly recommend that absolutely now the, the question is like i think they found a better way to to utilize how to do it but if you think about it, in, at least in my household, that discussion takes place almost on every other day basis because they always want something and we always talk about you need to earn it. Well, this is the way to actually positively channelize it in a, in, a, in a way that you can visualize their efforts better. They can visualize their efforts and see other kids doing it and then they will be encouraged to do the same way. So yeah, I would highly, rec highly recommend allowances. We, so we, we play a game at dinner when we go out that is, is called how much is the bill? Because my kids don't appreciate or have not in the past appreciated what it costs to go out to dinner. Okay. Um, and when they realize what things cost and when they pay for it, it changes like, hey, I'll just take water with, you know, with a lemon to... Oh, well, I'll have lemonade, right? Like at the end of the day, no one's really counting on food, but for them to understand like what's what, it's okay, right? You know, and I think that you can't do, um, you, you, I mean, there, there's a difference between, my dad always told me that there's a difference between a need and a want. And if you can clearly state what a need is and a want is, then you've achieved the goal of how to save money and how to be, you know, how to manage your lifestyle for, for funding. And my, I think my specific kids are very sheltered in that fact that their need and want is always a need, uh, you know? And I think that this has helped them at least understand what things cost. They look at not only the menu now, they look at pricing, right? And I'm not telling them not to order something, but the whole fact that they realize that, hey, you know what? Maybe if I order this instead of this, or can I split this with you? I mean, there's a lot of these other conversations that weren't there before, you know, that, hey, why don't we order three things and share between four of us versus let's all order something, you know? Um, and uh, I think that we, we waste a lot as well, right? That we over order sometimes, uh, allowing us to waste the food. So we don't, we don't need to do that. They, can, they realize they can order even during the meal, right? Like, hey, oh, can you bring me one other of this, right? You know? Um, and so it's helped them in their mind, at least I've seen the, the thought process change, you know? So I, I would recommend it because it's very hard to teach that much later. You know, if you don't do it early enough for them to understand that, right? And they, they go with their friends and so they, they're used to certain things, right? Like, oh, you know, my friend's ordering this, let me order this, right? You know? Hey, uh, the other, I'll, I'll second that. And uh, uh, Bhavan, I think, uh, <clears throat> said it earlier also. Uh, the, the biggest advantage I found is uh, when you actually do give the alarm stem, they monitor it, okay? And I've seen if I deliberately skip one, uh, you know, one time, He'll come to me, hey, what happened? You know, what happened here? Where's my allowance? And uh, sometimes he gets a little concerned as to, you know, what, you know, what are you going to do? So it's, it's, it's a way of, I think it's a way for, for us to uh, make them uh, be aware that money is earned, first of all, as, as you know, Nick actually, I think, has found a very good way of, of making them earn it well, our kids have chores also they have to do but we don't we haven't linked it to a direct uh, payment as such which uh, may be a very good idea he's found but uh, 
they monitor it and then they make sure that if they have some need or or, or want which is very fungible right <laughs> the, the 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 lines are not clear there but let's say they are trying to save for a cell phone or this or that he you know he makes sure that he has that much money with him for for him to buy that so i would highly recommend it too and, and not only that but like you know on birthdays when they receive you know cash or something like that the first thing they do is they come to me and they're like dad here's this add it to my account and literally i go to my app and i right click and i say here add move x dollar from my account to theirs because they gave me cash and i, I moved it to there so they're like now they're they're vested in that hey you know you know what i want to see it in my account right you know or my account value is so and so right so um i don't know if that has to do with a little bit of greed maybe so I mean, <laughs> yeah. the, the right jade thing maybe at one point but i think the whole value of them understanding what money is and being able to save in different ways uh will teach them how to manage it So taking a step back, remember that we talked about money as the one of the very oldest meta realities we believe in. We when we talked about stories, we talked about life is a story that we tell ourselves and we the reason that we're successful as a species is we because we're we can behave flexibly in large numbers because we believe in stories with our imagination. And so you may think that I don't believe in any re meta realities. I only believe in the real reality, but that's not true. You believe in money and money is one of the oldest meta realities we have. It's one of the most very oldest stories that we tell ourselves to allow ourselves to cooperate because if we don't, then we realize that, you know, the cash is just pieces of paper. And so that brings up a very in interesting question Boris brought up is that this idea that these money, this money is linked to the chores and it's linked to providing this value. And that's certainly what we find out, we find everywhere. We do our jobs for money and, but should it be like that in the family, right? I'm not, you know, I love you guys, right? So I'm not taking the position that you're wrong. And in fact, I probably will give my kids an allowance, but there is a case to be made that it shouldn't be like that, right? Does anybody want to make that case for me? You're talking about don't pay them for the chores? Yeah, it's a family responsibility and it's something we should do as a family and it's something we should do because it's the right thing to do, not because we get paid for it. Right, so, I mean, I don't even have this app what Nick just mentioned. So my kids getting allowances is just the monthly allowances and, and we have a fight over, well, this is your responsibility. You're supposed to do this, not ask for money, like wash the car and all. If, if I ask for something very specific or something that is not usually done, that's a different story. But you, yeah, we can make a case both ways, but I do not know what other way we can teach kids about responsibilities other than you have to earn it. When we say the word earn it, what do you mean is if it's not the money, right? What other way kids can earn certain things? I mean, you can say, oh, you earn my respect, you earn the, this, but okay, there is no respect -o meter that I can measure the respects, you know? So this is the, to me, this is the easier way to teach and uh, learn. Maybe it's not, that as a family, you're right. I mean, it is everybody should feel responsible, but if they are not, what other way to do it? Tim, Tim, I, I'll give you a practical example. And, you know, because, you know, your kids' grandparents live here, okay? You may be able to manage what you're trying to do, maybe with you and your wife, but the moment there's a, your ex, your family gets bigger, like your, your, your parents come or her parents come, the whole game changes because like, you know, they, they will abuse that, right? They will go and they, and, and, you know, like, like, you know, if they have to do the dishes, my grand, you know, my in-laws are doing the dishes. I'm like, what's going on? Right, Dia? For your chores? No. Right? No. You, you let them do the dishes, right? Okay, you can leave now. I'm in class, thanks. No, you're only in my class. So, so what happens is, is that we can't discipline our kids and our parents. Okay, you know, and you know, it's it's a little bit complicated because 
then they don't appreciate it. They're like, someone else is going to do it, so it's okay, right? Someone in the family is going to do it, so it's okay, you know? And that's what happens with their chores too, right? Like, we go pick it up, right? Well, if you're going to be principled about it, I, 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 I'm with you. Like, don't do it, right? Don't clean their room. Don't help them do something. Like, let, let them struggle. Don't, don't help them brush their teeth and this and that and whatever, and then we'll see, right? You know? <laughs> but that's not how it kind of works out, you know? No, I certainly understand. I, I'm not attacking anybody, and I think that these pros – definitely outweighs these cons of the uh, allowances, the pros of the value of the dollar, the managing your account, looking at your things. You know, I'm totally fine with that. There are cons on the other side too of, well, if you grow up like I did, you didn't have an allowance. There's certainly cons on that side, which I grew up with. But um, any questions on anything we talked about uh, or any new topic about kids and money and money and Jainism? I just have a, a comment to, to make on on the question you, you made me think a little bit. So if it's not money, what else, right? I mean, what are they earning? Uh, it's, uh, and if we think about in terms of Jainism, I mean, it's a positive karma, right? I mean, helping your family, helping your parents, doing your chores, contributing, uh, which you can measure in a way, uh, at least uh, practically or physically, you can measure it. Uh, and, and the reality is right now, uh, we're kind of here in the mix. We are preparing ourselves, our family for two, two causes. One is as we talk about education is about, you know, kind of doing well for your family or your, yourself. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, going better, on the journalism side, doing better for your soul. If we, if we're just thinking about from that, I mean, you know, that this, these are the two challenges. I mean, if we're just focusing on one. That'd be easy. Said, okay, you know, you just have to do it, and and that's you're building positive karma, and you just know it. However, from your your Jainism knowledge, uh, whereas on this front, we are preparing them for, uh, I guess, we, if we can quote it, real quote unquote real world, right, where they have to go manage their accounts and things like that. So so that's it's it's two different things, I think, and that's why it's hard to uh, connect, at least for me in my mind, uh, from what I heard. That's the whole reason we have this class. That has been the number one goal of this class from day one is bringing these two worlds together. That is, how can they not be separate worlds? How can they be the same world? Well, I, I won't get my graduate certificate next week or whenever it is because I, <laughs> I haven't really figured this out yet. <laughs> Questions or comments about anything we talked about today? Thank you very much for your time this week. I do not, yes. One thing I do want to mention, and I think this is where it connects, and I, I, I heard something that I think it's worth sharing. Um, I, I was hearing to uh, and he talked about uh, fragments of friendship. And I think it's a connection with what we discussed and what we do in this class. So he said there are four kind of friends. Uh, one is, he's called Tali friend. Tali means like, you know, like whenever you go to eat, you call somebody and say, okay, where do you want to eat? And we go eat, eat uh, to, to that place. Second one is, uh, you know, a uh, gali friend. Meaning, you know, it's like, you, you just see, I don't have to explain that. It's just the, the way it's, it is. Like, you know, you just go and you, you connect with each other and, and uh, do things that you guys think fun. The third, third one is um, uh, kali friend. You know, it's, you're just a friend. You are uh, there when I need it, or you know, we just call each other when we want something or something like that. And the last one is Mali friend. Mali means like you know, gardener friend. The gardener, you know how they always have a little scissor and the cutter, and what they do is guide the the plants the way the plant should grow, uh, so that they don't go in either direction or something like that. And the way he described. Uh, you know, there's a word in Jainism called Kalyan Mitra. Uh, Kalyan Mitra is the one who uh, helps not, and the way he described it, his words is like, you know, the other friends help for this life. Ajanam Mate. And then the other friend, the Mali or the Kalyan Mitra, has for firm uh, uh, next life, basically, not just this life, the next life, you know, the. Uh, the friends that help each other in this life are the, the three, the, therefore, you know, all the things that happen uh, to your body and your mind 
whereas the uh, the Kalyan Mitra helps your Atma. And uh, I mean, there are a lot of other things he said about it, but it's just you know one of those things that that we discover. And I think uh, what he said it's you have to have a Kalyan Mitra, and you you should be a Kalyan Mitra for somebody. Uh, and that's in the, the purpose of that should be helping uh, on a level uh, like Amari and you know help them grow. And it's not a, a a sort of a rocket science the way I thought about it. It's just helping somebody in a in a how to grow in their atma. And I think that's what you're doing. So uh, I I consider all of all everybody here in this class a Kalyan Mitra because you're helping us to uh, to grow uh, spiritually uh, in terms of atma and not just uh, you know in the practical life to live this just a single life. Absolutely. It's hard to do this alone. Even if you had all the knowledge, it's very hard to do it alone mm-hmm. to because it feels like you're going against the current, right? If it's it's better if we have a group of people and we do it together. And it's better if we bring Jainism into our lives and we find ways to keep it there and we find ways to um, bolster each other. So I definitely agree with that. Uh, other questions or comments about anything we talked about? Uh, I just have actually a question for the entire group. Um, and it's, it's on what you said uh, at the end, Tim. Um, you know, try to bring Jainism into everything we do, right? And oftentimes I've found when I try to do that, it's, you know, um, it's, a, it, it's obviously difficult at times, but I also question, you know, whether it is appropriate. I mean, why... I understand in, in, in situations when there is a struggle in your mind. I understand when you're conflicted. I understand when things are difficult to figure out. You bring your religion in to help you out, right? But in mundane things, right? I mean, when there is no struggle, where there's nothing bothering or, or, or kind of when things are even straightforward, you know, we'll try you know, the idea to bring Jainism in, is that really needed or is that, that really, I don't know. I'm, I'm it's just a, a thought. I, 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 I wanted to see what the group thought. Yes. My answer would be yes, it is needed because a human life is extremely precious and you have this time to perform as much nirjara as possible. That is removing as much karma from your soul while you can. And so it is important. Let's say you have a very routine life and you're very well settled and it has very little to do with Jainism. Well, you could be performing so much Nirdra because of your good station in life that your future lives are going to be extremely benefited from it. And indeed, your current life will you will extremely benefit from the amount of Nirdra you can do. So my answer would be yes. Anybody else? Uh, Tim, I, I have something else to mention uh, once uh, we're ready. Oh, okay, yeah, sure, no problem. I, I just wanted to mention about uh, something that we are preparing for is Tapo One Shabir. You guys probably have seen the, the messages uh, for it. It's going to be in July after... Um, uh, the Jaina Convention, uh, about 10th of July, um, and it's going to be for 10 days. And what we're trying this time is two things. So, you know, there are kids, we have seen that from seven to uh, almost like at the end of middle school or, or a little bit in the high school are interested in that. But if the kids are, if you have young, uh, even older kids, what we're trying to do is kind of create a youth ambassador program where they work with the speakers who are some of the speakers that we're going to have in in Tapo and Shibir is Jaina speakers. So this this youth ambassadors will work with the speakers before the Shibir. So it's a sort of a flexible time. And these guys are, you know, they're obviously advancing Jainism, but they're also professionally CEOs and uh, in, in really good positions. So uh, this guys, the, the, the youth ambassadors will help them prepare uh, their pre-class, the class and the post-class type activities. So they will learn working with them preparing this thing. So 
if if you know anybody, uh, obviously, if your kids kind of between seven to uh, or sixteen or seventeen, uh, please consider signing up for the class. We think it's going to be very helpful. And then uh, at the same time, if there is a kid that you know of or uh, that you can think of uh, as a youth ambassador, let us know. Uh, we'll put them in touch of the the speaker so they can work with them and uh, and kind of learn as they prepare for uh for the shibit itself so uh yeah if, if you guys hear about it if you guys have any questions please reach out to us we have actually seen a pretty good response out of out of state already uh we have over uh, i think above 70 uh registrations uh and uh we would like to uh, make sure our houston kids get involved as much as possible that's great thank you yeah. so let's go back to porish's question is it appropriate to bring Jainism into everything you do? That's the whole, you know, reason for this class because we want to promote that. So I, I'm very open to questions and very op open to skepticism on that subject. Why is it important? Why can't we leave Jainism for Sundays? You know, why can't we? Why should we? If if everything's going great in our life, why should we bring Jainism? into Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday? Actually, Tim, uh, I didn't mean to just leave it for Sunday. Okay. What I meant, what I meant really was... Um, Sunday morning. Only Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I meant really was... Uh, I mean, if it's a straightforward activity, What's, you know, why, why we, if it's a very difficult situation that you're faced with, uh, you have a, you know, you have a dilemma, it's a, it's a, it's an issue of, uh, you know, we can't decide, you know, it's a, it maybe an ethical dilemma, maybe a financial dilemma, whatever. And, um, and then you bring uh, Jainism in and, you know, because you're looking for, the correct answer but if it's a straightforward thing there is no dilemma then why would you insert it then it becomes almost like an obsessive thing right you're always trying to do things only through the lens of your religion and that becomes more like uh, you know like these uh, other religions uh, that we hear of right it's very fanatic it's I think uh, you know, becomes uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, what's the word, the uh, radical, radicalism, uh, you know, teetering on radicalism. I, I'm not saying it's wrong. I mean, I'm just saying, what is the place, uh, where, where, where do you think is the line that needs to be drawn, if there is one? That That's what I didn't mean to say there's a specific time for religion. That's not what I'm... Okay. So the difficult situation, so, you, so you're on board with, okay, I'm in front of it, I have a difficult situation, and Jainism is going to help me through that difficult situation. But now when I'm not presented with something, why should I think about Jainism or why should I incorporate it into my life? Well, you are faced with a difficult situation right now that you do not understand. You are trapped. Your soul is bound by these karma and it is an in incredible pain. And you think, well, what are you talking about them? Or I am not, I'm free. My, I'm, you know, my soul is not in pain. I am not in pain right now. Well, you just don't know it yet. Okay. Have you ever had something where you made, it made you say, I didn't know how good it could be. You know, I had something like that when I moved jobs, I got paid more for doing less work just because I had, you know, experience or years under my belt or the right degree, right? And I was like, I didn't know how good that could be. Or have you ever been in like a chronic pain from when you were young? If you had, I know some people with back pain and they finally got that surgery and they're like, is this how normal people live? Like, I didn't know how good it could be to be pain-free. Right now, you are in an incredible amount of pain and Jainism can help you through that. You might not think so, but part of Jainism is understanding how much pain you're in right now and how good it could be. 
we do not realize how good it could be when we say your soul has the characteristics of infinite bliss infinite knowledge infinite energy those are just words right it doesn't have it doesn't mean anything to my day to day to day life if you realize how good it could be to tap into that infinite knowledge infinite bliss infinite energy then you will understand how much pain you're in right now and that's part of this too is to try to get you to understand the reality that we're in, the pain that we're living in. Other comments, I don't want it to just be from me. I want Boris to have a lot of different viewpoints. So does anybody else have a kind of a different take on it? You know, one, one thing I would say first that, you know, if anything else, to reset your thought process and say you are still on the right track right so it's not about an exercising thinking of Jainism and then taking the next step in my opinion sometimes is you know we say count your blessings or something so even if it's things going smoothly we want to make sure that we are still on the right track for instance if you are taking the trash out considering that we're not going to walk on the grass or something you know simple things like that keeping those thoughts, I sometimes it feels like you are going to just continue to think that way. But that's where that what we had that exercise what two weeks ago about mindfulness and have a a secondary, you know, your vision is always there that you are still walking on the right path. Um, probably can uh, help in that direction in, th- in in thought process. It's not practical. It's not feasible for me to constantly be. Uh, acknowledge that yes i'm thinking of jainism for every single step i take and do but this does help to reset at time to time and making sure you 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 assure yourself that you are still continue towards your end goal and it change it changes your i mean once you once you stop walking on that grass you just stop doing that so it's a part of your life then right you know it's it, it changes the whole thing for that and so i can tell you first from my side that one thing that's helped me kind of do that is this uh, is saying the the you know the mala once a day, and it's it's kind of comical because you know I think that I failed in that and Gosho may have not quite failed originally in that, but the whole fact that we do it daily allows us to go ahead and refocus at least for that 10, 12 minutes that hey, uh, you know it helps us concentrate and refocus. And I think that helps us clear our mind a bit to focus on being Jay, you know? And, you know, I I think uh, what you're saying may have some partial truth because it's not like every decision we stop and say, Oh, let's go to the Bible and say, Oh, you know, Jainism is saying this, that's not, that's not how this functions. We're going to have to change our lifestyle for that to work. Right. And so these small things, whether that's walking on the grass or, or, or what have you, I think the whole fact that you're acknowledging that is a step forward in the right direction, right? You know, um, and slowly, slowly we're going to get there, but you have to do what works for you. And, you know, the whole fact that, you know, Bobin and me here are very good at doing no car before I am helps me become better at doing no car, uh, right after them now. So, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, and, and it does, when you when you know that you are not supposed to do and you do it at times it's and you have no choice it, it makes it a little bit painful uh my my, my nephew he's a, he's a five years old and he he loves soccer and he's out of state um fortunately this year he he's been able to actually he's seven he's been able to remotely access this parshala uh, we set him up and he's going to complete his first year at parshala and he's in pennsylvania and day before yesterday my sister was telling me he was questioning why am i walking on the grass and and he's, he loves soccer he plays soccer all day you know and then those those type of things that that will come across but at least when you have a choice and when you can make that choice you will make the right choice and you uh, that is absolutely a critical point you bring up, Bhavin. Those are the issues, right? So, you know, your nephew loves soccer, but then his mind is 
is is con- is tormented because he does you know why is he walking on the grass and i think and and, and by by the way nick uh, and bhavan both i appreciate very much the perspective i really do and uh uh i just don't see the value in getting to that tormented stage right uh but i uh, you know uh, i mean maybe tim is is we are just there, we are always tormented we just don't know that is is probably what the point is well it's not even about tormenting it's about understanding the options right it's and acknowledging that there's another option right? and you brought up a good point you know it's that torment may lead to radicalization as you put it in that we're always thinking about jainism and what the right respect to do with jainism what is Jainism tells us we should do and what we want to do or what other people are doing. But it all comes down to um, that torment is there, that di- that dissonance is there in our mind because we don't believe we're souls yet. Okay. And once you, what you describe as torment is simply believing you're a soul and acting accordingly. Once you believe that you're a soul, then you will start acting accordingly without any dissonance in your mind. And we're, and that's not to say, you know, all, a lot of us don't believe we're souls, and that's fine. We're trying to get there. That's what we're trying to see in the distance, and we're trying to help each other get there. And, but this is a very important point. I'm sorry that we don't have time to address it today. I would like to address it um, in another class, and we can talk about it more fully. But this is something that um, I'm very passionate about, um, and that's an important point for people to understand so we can all overcome overcome this together. Thank you, everybody, for um, coming this week. I really appreciate your time coming every day, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, team, and all the today's sessions. Thank you. On the college. Thank you. Thank you.